Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thanks for joining me today on the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. In the world of technology we live in, many of us have connected with people through social media. We've become friends with people we've never met and begun to care for people who we only know through reading their words. Maybe some of you are thinking that about me if you've been listening for a while. And if you have, I'd love to hear from you, so don't be afraid to reach out. The wonderful thing about this connected world is that we can be inspired by others who are doing amazing things constantly. It is sometimes hard to imagine how things used to be. You would maybe be inspired the weekend of your local marathon in your hometown, but that inspiration would have to carry you over until next year. Or maybe, if it was an Olympic year, I guess you could hear about the inspirational feats these athletes completed. But now, with this world, and especially through blogs, companies and individuals can share their journey and develop a relationship with their listeners or readers. One blog I've loved for a while now is called NYC Running Mama. I've never met Michelle in person, but we're definitely friends. Well, I guess I like to think so, but we support one another in our running experiences. Michelle is one of those people you can't help but root for. You want her to succeed and you want her to reach those goals. You can tell she's a genuinely good person, the kind of person there should be more of in this world. This interview will make it apparent that Michelle puts her kids first, no matter what but she makes an effort to make sure that she has her time as a runner. This interview will inspire you, I'm sure, and give other runners hope that it's possible to juggle training at a higher level, yet still be there for your kids. You're going to love Michelle as much as I do, I just know it. So who is she? Well, Michelle Gonzalez is a mother of two. She's an Ironman, ultra and marathon runner. She's done three tours in Iraq as a military intelligence officer, and she ended up as a captain. She writes for Women's Running Magazine, is a member of the Socony 26 Strong Team, and has PRs of 1957 in the 5K, 131 in the half, 315 in the marathon, and a 1306 Ironman. Now you're going to hear that Michelle didn't start off there, she definitely worked her way down to those times. So what are Michelle and I going to talk about today? How to juggle young kids and yet still take your running seriously. Why we need to be more flexible with our plans and adjust as life happens, especially when children are involved. That's something I have no experience with. The importance of running by effort rather than pace. And how the women's running community is continuing to move in the right direction and what this looks for for the future. So that's enough of an intro from me. You ready to meet Michelle? Welcome to the Runs of the Top podcast, Michelle. It's great being here. Thank you for having me. We're excited to have you, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be excited to listen to this one. So I told our listeners a little about you in the intro, but what can you tell us about your story, how you became the runner you are today? Well, I'm a mom of two, first and foremost. That's my... Be my priority and <laughs> my favorite thing in the world. Um, I'm a wife and um, stay at home mom mostly. I mean, I do some blogging and social media stuff, but I do, I'm at home all day. Um, you know, I've always been running just for years. It wasn't the priority. It was more as to stay in shape for sports that I played growing up. And then when I was in the army, it was just a requirement to run, take the PT tests, but it wasn't really my love. It wasn't something that I enjoyed doing. Um, and it slowly became another love of my life during my deployments. It was just something that I was able to hold on to and have that was mine and control. And it's really just, you know, through pregnancy and childbirth and um, now as a mom, it's, it's kind of the one thing that I can focus on on a daily basis work towards, have some goals, Um, you know, it gets me out of the house for a little bit every day um, and just keeps me focused on something. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's kind of like your way of keeping your identity? You know, you hear a lot about parents that 
get to the point where the kids are just their life and they have nothing for themselves. So it's like your way of keeping something for you. It definitely is for me. You know, I think like some parents, they, they have other means that, you know, they either, some people like to go out eating and (laughs) drinking with friends. And it's not that I don't enjoy that, but this is my way of doing that on a daily basis. You know, even if it's just an hour out of the house, it's, it's a way for me to just get out, clear my mind, have some me time. Uh, that's not this. I mean, some days I do run with the boys in the stroller or I'm on the treadmill, but it does keep me having a small part that I can focus on every day mm-hmm. on myself. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that's important as well. And, you know, it doesn't take anything away from being a mother, but uh, you know, everyone needs something for themselves. So it's good. And was there a moment in particular that you kind of realized that running was what you wanted to, you know, that was your thing? Or did it just, like you said, slowly build over the time? Um, you know, well, when I was in college, I signed up and ran a marathon and, you know, it was, it was a decent time. It wasn't, I didn't qualify for Boston or anything, but it was, I was proud of my time. It wasn't until a few years later, I ran the New York city marathon before a deployment. And, um, I had actually done a little bit of training for this one. Um, and I was in better shape and I mean, I ran one of the fastest times still to this day of my life. And it was at that moment that I was like, wow, like I, you know, I qualified for Boston and it it was just surprised. Like I felt so great during the whole race that I was like, I'm, you know, this is something that I enjoy doing and I'm pretty good at it, you know? So maybe, and then that's the deployment that I, ended up really focusing on long distance running from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And what did your like tours in Iraq teach you about, you know, making the most of your life? Did it kind of teach you about, uh, you know, really giving your all to things like running where you, you can control, you know, many aspects of it? You know, a big thing that deployment taught me was if you, you'll find a way to do something if you, if it means that much to you, um, we were, I mean, we worked long shifts while we were deployed. Um, and so for me, it was, I would end up going to work, start the day earlier than I really needed to. So that way I could take time in the middle of the day to go running. And so it, and I found for me, you know, even just getting over my computer and, getting outside, it it gave me, I'd come back and I'd feel energized and refreshed and ready to, you know, spend the next however many hours working. Um, But it really taught me that, you know, you will make the time and you'll find a way to get it done if it means something to you. And I've kind of kept that with me, you know, even now with children, it's the same thing. You know, there's never enough time in the day, whether you're a parent or you're working full time, but you want something that badly you'll you'll find a way to make some time for it definitely so what would you what would your best advice be to mothers or fathers who say you know I just don't have time for running do you have any like tips or any thoughts on how to fit it in well for me the best way I mean I like to get up early and just get it done I find that if I procrastinate and say I'm gonna do it later it typically ends up not being done the day the day tends to get away and you never really know what kind of curveballs are going to come at you. And, you know, quite honestly, by the end of the day, I'm pretty exhausted. Like we, we, my boys and I, we spend a lot of time outside and I just don't have the energy late at night to run. So, you know, one of my tips would just be to try and do it first thing in the morning. That's always for me when I have the most energy, I'm the most focused. Um, you know, and I would just say to start small, you don't have to say, Oh, I'm going to, I have to run five miles, you know, even if it's just taking 10 minutes a day and then working from there saying, I'm going to start dedicating 10 minutes a day to being a little more active or doing what you want to make some time for. And then just try and increase that. Cause once 10 minutes becomes routine, then try 20 and then try 30. Um, it could be a little overwhelming to say, Oh my gosh, I have to find you know, 45 minutes a day now to fit in running. I don't have enough time to to clean the house, you know, but yeah. And I try to find like, if I, if I need to sleep in one day, then I'll take the boys in the stroller or, you know, I'll shift things around and try and make things work that way. And how much do you involve the boys in your training in general? (laughs) Like, do you, I I mean, we talked recently about uh, you were in a Buzzfeed article Uh, which I'll put a link to in the show notes um, about running with them. But how involved would you say they are in your running? 
you know, I mean, just from being up and seeing, I mean, my husband runs too. Like, so they, to them, it's normal that mommy and daddy run every day, you know, and my husband does triathlon, so he's not running, but he'll, he's doing something. And so in their mind, like their sneakers are their, they call them their running shoes. And to them, that's, that's normal. And that's what everybody does. And so they, you know, my oldest is at the age where he doesn't really want to sit in the stroller anymore. He wants to run with me. And so, you know, it throws a curveball in, in running with them in the stroller, but like, he just wants to get up and run. And I, I let him now, like if he, and however far he wants to run and then he gets back in the stroller and then we continue on. And so, you know, and so that's actually another tip, um, you know, for, for parents, I've learned that to ease up on sticking to, a formal plan. Like it, it's hard to say, I'm going to do this and stick to it every single day. There are times where, you know, the, my training plan calls for X amount of miles and I'm only able to get in two. And I've learned to kind of ease up and be okay with that because the priority for me is my boys and spending time with them. And if that means something needs to be shifted or, you know, even skip, then you know, it's going to happen, especially when you start talking about little ones in the picture. Mm-hmm. So, And how do, how do you stay like positive about things? You know, I'm thinking about those runners who maybe are in the earlier stages where they're, you know, beginners and listening and they're thinking, you know, people tend to when they miss one or they have to skip one, they think, oh, I've got to make it up or, oh, well, I, of course, I've already fa- failed. You know, how am I ever going to keep this up? How do you keep it from disheartening you? I mean, that part, I, you know, that's definitely not, that's the tough part of it because I, I sometimes get down into that mindset too. It's like, oh, well, you know, I was supposed to do like a four mile tempo. Now I only have time for two. Is it even worth it to do two? And at the end of the day, like I would say it is like something is better than nothing. And so if you only have 20 minutes or 30 minutes instead of an hour, if you can, maybe just make it a faster paced run or maybe you know, if there's a way for you to swap days, or if you take a day off, maybe that means that the next day you can run a little bit further, like to kind of just be a little more flexible with your training when you're starting out. Don't feel so stuck to the training plan. That way, if things need to be switched, you don't feel like you're a failure. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice for people to hear, especially coming from you with a mother, a mother of two younger boys, you know, a lot of people listening are probably in those same shoes. And, you know, they they don't know what to do when they do skip out and it it I mean you know I'm not I'm not ever in the situation where where I've had to deal with that but I think that advice is going to be very helpful for people um and then when it comes to like running with them you said you know you'll let them run with you now but do you find that uh in the past you would have thought oh no I'm not letting them slow me down to this pace whereas now you've kind of been like you know what does it matter if I run, you know, whatever they run, 12 minute pace, 15 minute pace on their, on my recovery run for, you know, half a mile, but it, it's bringing joy to him or what is your kind of thinking with that? Well, basically that, I mean, you know, I remember probably I, maybe about two years ago when I was, I felt more focused on the plan and not on just, you know, letting things just happen. Um, if they wanted to get up out of the stroller, it was like, no, I have to finish. Like I have to run these miles or, you know, even if like we passed like flowers and they wanted to get out, I I would feel like frustrated that they didn't want to just sit, you know? And I think part of it is like the older they get, like they, they get, their personalities are growing. They're also more determined. And, you know, I've learned too, just in general with kids, pick your battles. You know, this is not something that in the broad scheme of life, if I have to cut my run short by two miles, is that really going to affect me? Is that, you know, and even, even if it does affect the race, my goal race, is that really, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to qualify for the Olympics, win the Olympics. So is running a minute or two slower or whatever it may be, does, will that really matter? You know, and I've, I feel like that has made me a better runner, but it's also made me like a better mom. And so, um, that would be my, my advice yeah definitely I can I can 
relate to that in some ways off the other way I have a I have a friend who's very you know relaxed and chill and she just lets things happen and doesn't really mind when things you know making things up on the fly and you know I'd always say well how does she run that fast when she doesn't have a plan but I think it was part of that she just let things happen and she wasn't whereas I was thinking oh I've got to do this and I have to hit 9.00 on my watch or or it's not gonna you know or I'm gonna fail but you know it's good that you kind of learn to like adjust and yeah. be flexible which is part of being a mother so I you know this is in- interesting for me to learn and I'm sure a lot of the other mothers and fathers listening are kind of nodding their head with what you're saying so good advice <laughs> can you walk us through a typical day for you what does it look like uh if you, uh, you know a workout most, day maybe I yeah. guess um you know so most I try I'm trying to get back on the early morning wake ups. Um, We were away for a few weeks and I just kind of fell off that wagon. So, you know, I'm trying to get up most days like 4.45, 5 o'clock and try and be out the door by 5.30. Um, My oldest is an early riser. So some days he's actually up by that time. So um, (laughs) that is an early riser. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Since day one, he's always, he's always been early. So, um, you know, but then I, I'll either have to wake my husband up or just wait for him to get up before I can get out. But, you know, I'll try and get my run done by I'd say seven o'clock or so. Um, and then that's kind of really when the day starts. So like we'll have breakfast and then, um, shower somewhere in there as well. Um, we spend like a large part of the morning outside just because the Northeast, I mean, you, it's just so warm during during the summer so we do a lot in the mornings and then we'll usually come back and have some lunch and then we try try and do something with them in the afternoon like out of the house um even if it's just like a trip to target or visiting like one of my sisters who all live close by or my parents um it's just good for all of us just to get some time out of the house and then come back and we'll have dinner and usually bedtime for them is around eight and then for for me, I try and shoot for like 9.30 or 10 um, on a daily basis. Okay. So it's like a general, you know, and I, sometimes in the afternoon if there's time, I try and fit in some strength work or core work. Um, it just depends on the boys and how they're doing, how much I try and limit television time and that sort of thing. So if they've already watched a little, then I'll I do that after they go to sleep. It just, mm-hmm. you know, it just depends on the day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And let's kind of talk a bit about your, you know, your work. You said you you are a stay at home uh, mum mm-hmm. pr- uh, primarily, but you do, you know, you have your blog NYC mm-hmm. Running Mama, which I will put a link to the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc sixty six. But kind of tell us about how that's kind of grown you, you know, over the last year or so. I've really seen that your blog taken off, and you now write for women's running as well, and. How are the, you know, running related, being an ambassador for the sport, how that's kind of gone with you? Yeah, the, you know, it's interesting because I had no intention of blog. Like that was never something I even really knew. It was a world unknown to me. Um, but about three and a half years ago, I participated in um, a challenge within the New York City Marathon. Um, and I got to represent Staten Island, which is my home borough. One of the requirements was that they wanted the participants to become active on social media. And so I started a Twitter account. I started a blog. um, And I found that I I love the community. Like it it gave me a way to talk about running to, to other runners rather than to my family who was tired of hearing about it. And it gave me something to do, you know, while I was a stay at home mom. And so since then, it's it's it has kind of evolved into, um, you know, I do make some money from it, which is great, but I do it more because I, I truly love running. I love talking about it and, you know, sharing my experiences, if that's able to help anyone, either what I've done or what I haven't done. And, you know, um, and so, yes, I write for women's running now and starting to get into a little freelance work, which is good. It's giving me something, you know, to, to bring home a little more money. And, um, you know, it just gives me something to fill my time. Not that I have a lot of it, but, you know, something, (laughs) again, something dedicated to myself that I can do um, rather than just fill up my time, you know, at home all day. So, 
No, I think it's great. And, you know, I also have a personal vlog, which I have talked about, but, and I think it's, it is interesting to see how things kind of do evolve and how the women's community that both of us are in with, uh, within being a blogger and someone that does write about you know, your experiences and your running, you see other people kind of, I, I'm sure you get the same. I get a lot of people emailing me saying, you know, thank you for talking about this. I thought I was the only one. Mm. And, you know, we often hear about how women in general just want to tear each other down and women, you know, in power or women who are influencers kind of want to just make one another, like kind of climbing over one another to get to the top. But I don't see that within the community. I'm sure you don't, but it seems like people are very supportive of you and your training. Do you have any thoughts on why that is or has that been your experience? You know, for the most part, yeah, it has. And, you know, I'm still surprised that like people when they say like, oh, I follow you or it's still, you know, it's I I get it's I don't know the right word to use, but, you know, it's it's nice to hear that, that something I wrote can help someone else in some way. And I, I absolutely love the, the woman's running community um, that's out there. It's, you know, I mean, I'd say like 95% of the people that follow me are females. And I think it's just, it's such an amazing thing. You know, I've met some amazing people. I've made some fantastic friendships from the online uh, interactions. And it's just it's extremely supportive across the board. And I, I love being a part of it. I mean, that's really the driving factor for me is just, it makes me happy. It just, it really fills my heart. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And do you feel like uh, things are moving in the right direction? I actually talked a lot about this with uh, Catherine Switzer in episode uh, 59. And we talked about how, you know, we feel like if we're moving up uh, a giant hill pushing a boulder this is with women's rights and women's kind of inspiring one another and kind of moving forward uh with a women's movement would you say you've seen a definite difference in the last few oh, years oh definitely i mean you know and even um yesterday women's running announced or re released their cover and you know there's a a plus size model it's the first time i mean i think like I got goosebumps, you know? And so I think it's moving in such a amazing direction, celebrating females for what they can do, not necessarily what you look like. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I'm a part of it, that I'm, you know, my, that I'm just a member of this amazing community. Yeah. Yeah. I think Wazelle is really a big, big part of this within the running community as well which has been great to see but another brand who I know we're both very uh, <laughs> passionate about uh, Saucony we love our we love our Saucony um can you tell us a little about the Saucony 26 strong program <laughs> what is that and for people who don't yeah know. so it's an amazing program Saucony started a couple of years ago um the first year it was male and female but the past two years now, it's been just female they've focused on. Um, so with 26 total runners, it's thir 13 coaches. Um, and then the coaches get to pick their candidate, their cadet, who's going to run their first, their first marathon. And so the whole program revolves around this community then between these 26 runners where it's a support group. Um, the coaches, train, make the training plans and kind of mentor the first time runners uh, through the whole training program. And it culminates with um, a fall marathon. And this year it's going to be the Chicago marathon. So we're all going to be in Chicago that weekend. Um, you know, it's just going to be a whole weekend to celebrate, celebrate their hard work and everything they've done and then celebrate Sunday night after they run their first marathon. Oh, it's a fan, it's and a fantastic what, program. Yeah. Oh no, I definitely agree with that. And what what about someone a, a female listening now and they're thinking, oh, you know, I'd love to be a part of that next year. I've been thinking about doing a marathon. How would is there a way they can kind of keep involved with that? You know, my I would say just to kind of keep an ear on the either on the Saucony social media, um, or if you know of another coach who is involved in it, um, you know. I, I, my guess would be that they would do this again next year just because it has gotten such good feedback. So, you know, and I, I would love to be, a, I, I don't know for sure if they will or who they're going to involve in it. Um, 
So if you just keep an ear, you know, out on the social media channels, um, usually there's some publicity that goes around the time when the the coaches are picking their their cadets. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely, definitely. Um, and then just a question I was just curious about: Do you have a running role model? Is there someone that you know you've always kind of looked up to? Um, you know, I have a few. Um, I have to say, someone that really like became more of a role model to me was was Chris Lawrence after I met her at Boston. Um, it just you know sometimes you don't realize like how much you look up to someone until you meet them and then spend some time with them. And then you're like, this, this person is just like amazing. And really she, she's, she's, you know, and I, that we hadn't even met before in person and we spent the whole weekend together. We shared a hotel room just because costs in Boston were so expensive that weekend. So out of necessity, we were both looking for, for someone to, to room with. And, um, you know, I just have so much respect for, the way she balances being a mom to three young children. I'm, her husband is in the military, but he's often deployed. So, I mean, for all, you know, all intents and purposes, she's a single mom most of the time. And, she, you know, she's training for the Olympic qualifying time and mm-hmm. standard. And, and she does it with a, such grace and humility that, it, you know, it's, it's amazing. So I would say mm-hmm. for me, like, she's kind of been my role model yeah, I could definitely see that. And just for anyone listening, Chris is, uh, I think, 247, mm-hmm. yeah. correct, is what she's run. 247 in the marathon. And, you know, she's had a lot of setbacks, but she stays positive and keeps, you know, keeps trying, keeps her head down and keeps gritting it out. And, yeah, it is very inspiring to watch her. So, Chris, if you're listening, we, we both appreciate <laughs> you and look up to you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of talk about uh, running through pregnancy. What were your thoughts on that when, when you were pregnant? Did you run the whole way or just parts of it? So I ran until the end with both my sons. Um, my second, I had some back pain like a, somewhere at the start of third trimester. So I actually took a few weeks off, but I did pick it back up and continued until the end. Um, you know, with my first, it was like unknown. I didn't really know how I would feel. And there wasn't a lot. And I feel like there's still not a ton of information out there. If you're not on social media, like if you're on social media, then you probably have seen plenty of other moms run through pregnancy. But in terms of, I think it's getting better, the articles that are out there and that sort of thing. But for me, you know, my biggest it was Paula Radcliffe and Carrie Goucher. They were both due like three or four months before me. And so it was, that was nice for me when people questioned me running through pregnancy, I was able to, you know, there were articles in runner's world and various other places. And I would say like, you know, they're they They have doctors looking over them. If, you know, not to say that I was running the same mileage or pace, but you know, it just, everything is relative. So Um, I think that's even more so if you can, if they can do it with that many miles, then you can do it with less miles. Yeah. So, So, and then with my second, it was, you know, I had already gone through one successful and healthy. And, and so I was a little more at ease and I I did a little bit more, ran a little bit further. Um, I, I just felt a little more comfortable the second time around. So, you know, I think the biggest thing though is, you know, everyone is different. There are females that that run marathons or ultras when they're pregnant, you know, I think you just need to do what you're physically capable of and what you're, you're comfortable doing. I mean, if you, if you're not comfortable, if you feel like you may regret your decision running X number of miles during pregnancy, then don't, you know, don't do it. But that there's been plenty of females that have, have done marathons and so on. And so they should be the proof that you can do it if you want to. You know, I, for me personally, I kind of capped my mileage at 15, 16 miles. I didn't do anything longer than that. I, for me, I just wasn't, I wasn't comfortable doing much more. And so I didn't. And I, but I think my biggest piece of advice would be just to, it's an individual decision, however far you want to run, however often, you know, and I think, um, if you keep that in mind and just do what you feel comfortable doing, then, you know, you'll have a great pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Just even more again, like listening to your body, actually, you know, not sticking to what's on a schedule, but 
if you, you know, start running and you don't feel good, then okay, cut it, cut it shorter. Yeah. I mean, that was something I learned early on. There were some days where you'd start running and I'd have abdominal pain or something would feel like it was off and it, it just, there's no sense in forcing anything during pregnancy, you know? And so you just chalk it up and you try again tomorrow. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good advice there. Thank you for sharing that. And then do you run on your own most of the time or do you have other people to run with? Or has I'm work? mostly solo running. Um, you know, it started out because it was a choice. Like I, I like running and I still do. There are plenty of days where I wish I had a training partner, you know, especially as like marathon training progresses and you're doing your fifth 18 plus mile and you're like, gosh, I got to go out by myself again. You know, I, I just haven't found anyone um, local that, either runs at the same time in the morning is because I like to run early. So it either has to be an early riser or, you know, someone that runs around the same pace as me so we can push each other. Um, I just, you know, I've been on the lookout. I just haven't found anyone yet. So, <laughs> well, anyone listening right now? And if you're uh, living where, where exactly in New York are you? This is the end of Staten Island. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyone listening and, uh, <laughs> We're going to go actually, let's go on now then to talk about your, um, your PR at Boston. Um, we'll kind of talk from your journey here about your first marathon was a 354, correct? So if you want to kind of tell us about your, your running story, who, uh, (laughs) starting there, getting down to Boston and tell us about that. Uh, so that's my first marathon was 354. That was I was a senior in college and it was, I got the bright idea over the summer. Hey, let's, let's train for a minute. Let's get into shape. You know, I was going to be, I was going to graduate and then be an officer in the army. So I was like, I want to be in great shape. Let me train for my first marathon. And, you know, I, looking back, I mean, I didn't really train. I maxed at 16 miles. It wasn't like I was entirely focused on, but I, I mean, I got through the race was great. But I really didn't have an urge to do another marathon for a number. I think it was five years later, I think I ran my next marathon. And 2007 is really when, like, the ball started moving for me and and racing. Um, That I ran a 323 at New York in 2007 and then deployed, but then ran Boston, like, 18 months later. So I, I got to defer a year because... Well, I guess I, I think the time was different. The registration date was later, but I was able to defer because I was deployed. And then um, I ran Boston and had a great race and um, didn't run a marathon then for a while. I got pregnant. I was training for an ultra, but then I got pregnant. And then, you know, so it wasn't until, it really wasn't until 2012 that I started running marathons on a regular basis or, you know, twice a year basis. And I had a, a tough stretch of races for a multitude of reasons. Mentally, I, I don't think I was prepared. You know, I think the, the mental strength was not there for me when things got tough during a couple of the races. I, my, I just kind of quit and my body followed. You know, in one instance, I think I was hugging the overtraining line. I think I was close to, to being overtrained. And I just physically, when it was time to race, I just, my body was not ready to respond um what's sorry I just want to pause you one second what's kind of um symptoms did you see right then that people might kind of if they are listening and think they go through the same thing? um you know I was constantly tired and not just the tired from marathon training but just like exhausted um I was started running slower in workouts no longer being able to, I was also quitting I quit a couple of long runs and just like called my husband to come pick me up. I just mentally, I, I'd set out for these runs and my pace would start slowing and I would just quit. Like I just didn't have that push in me, you know, and looking back now I see I was, I was training outside of my ability. I was pushing too hard on, um, almost all of my runs. And so I kind of just reached a point where I was just burned out and, um, I was too caught up in the moment to know it at the time, but, um, but you know, I'm able to look back now and see everything that I was doing wrong. And so, um, so yeah, it was, it was a, a couple of years of just not great races for me. 
And so over the fall and winter, I really made an effort to do a couple of things. My easy runs, I stopped wearing a watch and I just kind of ran. You know, I, I know the mileage by my house, like the cracks in the road, what's a mile, what's two miles. And so I'd run the distance and I would no, I, I mean, I have an idea if it was close, but I was running, I ended up running those much slower, which I think was beneficial. Um, and I worked on my mental game for the race. And, you know, I did some reading and I did some, um, even some like meditation on it and spoke to a few friends who gave me some tips. And, um, you know, I think all of that played into why I, I mean, I had a good day at Boston. It was a great day for me. Um, you know, I think I'm still kind of riding that PR high. So um, it just taught me a lot that that one race. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to get our listeners to uh, make sure you do when you check out uh, Michelle's stuff, you do look on that Boston recap or yeah. on her, you know, social media that day, the the image of you finishing or after the race, like that warms my heart even mm. thinking about it. It's just the smile on her face is that smile that we all want. You know, the the smile that you, you dream of getting when you accomplish that goal, it's it's that smile. And it you can't not smile if you're looking at it. So make sure you check that out. Yeah, it was but tell us about it was uh mixed with I mean, yeah. I crossed the finish line and I just I I started crying. Um when we made the the right onto no well it was one of those streets I don't but I started crying and then when I crossed the finish line I was sobbing and I remember the one of the volunteers was like worried and like and I was like no I'm fine I'm like I'm just happy, <laughs> I'm happy. like this is like years <laughs> of like you know, knowing that I could run th this time but just not not getting everything lined up and this was finally the race where you know everything everything lined up and honestly the biggest one of the biggest things for me was I, um, I ran on effort. I, um, changed my, my view on my Garmin. I, cause I, I still, I'm still a, a, like a data nerd. I still want that data, but I didn't want it in real time. I didn't want us to be able to look down and see my pace. And so I, I changed the view so I could only see total time. So I, I didn't know, uh, as I was running, I would know as I hit the mile splits but I wouldn't know every second of the race because I would become obsessed with like glancing down. And if I, in pre previous races, if I saw I was slowing down, that would be the end of the race for me. Because in my mind, I had to, if I was slowing down, then my body was, yeah, I had reached that point. And so I, I only ran on effort and I based the whole race on that. And, you know, my splits were consistent until the end. And it was just, it was one of those races where everything clicks, where it's just a good day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's fantastic. And such good advice there. I, 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 I've only discovered this myself when I went through the same thing at London. I didn't look at my watch. I, I know anyone listening is saying, yeah, but I can't not look at my watch. Physically force yourself not to. Like Michelle said, turn it off so you yep. can't see it. Or, you know, when you get to a mile marker, if you don't want to look at it, like force yep. yourself to look in yep. the other direction so you do not see it because it makes an incredible difference and you rely on those internal things that your body is telling you rather than what you feel. I mean, we've all been guilty of, you know, seeing a time on our watch and thinking, oh, that's too slow. And then you pick it up. But then you go through the next mile and you're too fast. Then you slow down and then you just play this game and you never get in a rhythm. So what Michelle's saying is is so important. And I know even Paula Radcliffe, when she was running her world records, that's what she did. She didn't she didn't rely on time. She just, just ran. So I know it sounds hard and it is scary. I mean, you can attest to this yeah. the first few times. Yeah. You have to really fight your mind on not looking but it makes such a huge difference and for you that was your breakthrough yeah. um race and it was 315 315 yes okay. yep um, so yeah and you, you have to you have to trust your training mm -hmm. and just kind of like put your hands up and just be like I'm gonna run what I'm gonna run like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna force like it, it will happen um so, you know, I had done that for all of my long runs during the winter, which was really easy because I would keep my watch under my jacket. And so I would literally run the whole run and have not a clue as to a split, nothing. And there were so many runs where I'd finish and look down and just be like, wow, those were not just like 
it wasn't just, they were within a few seconds from start to finish. And it was like, I, I know my body better than I think I do. And so why am I then relying on pace during a race? Like I'm not doing it during training. So I'm going to, you know, and it was, I mean, it was, I was nervous because it was really the first time in a marathon. I did it for New Jersey, but I, I relied more on like looking down at each mile marker and like this time I kind of tried my best. Like you said, it's hard though, because it would beep and I'd be like, you know, You're like, don't there were some times I looked down. Yeah, I hear you. So. <laughs> I had the same thing many times, especially when I went past the halfway mark in the marathon. I was like, don't look, don't you dare look, stay away. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to kind of go over a little more for you giving advice to people who, you know, hope for runners who think, well, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to run, you know, a 315, but you started at a 354. And, you know, no, not everyone has the capability of running a 315, but, you know, you took that much time off your t- off your marathon time. So kind of what advice would you give on p- for people who think, you know, oh, I, I run a four and a half hour marathon the best I can do is a, you know, 410. Well, I also want to say, you know, the 354 was after years of running at West Point. And I remember my first, um, we had to do a two mile test when we were um, at West Point. And my first two mile test was over 16 minutes. So I, I mean, you know, it was eight, it was an eight minute pace or just slower for, for two miles. And I, I've looked, and I think that comes out to about a four thirty marathon, you know, and I know that's not totally accurate, but you know, it wasn't like I was like running these times to begin with. It did take time. Um, you know, I think everyone always wants to be faster. Like you would, like I, you know, I have my eyes on another time goal now that I'm going to be shooting for, but you know, I think that one of the big things to focus on is just to have patience. It's, it's, it, it's not going to happen overnight and you don't want it to, if you, if it, if you do too much at once, you risk overtraining, you, you risk injury because your body's not ready to be running that fast. Um, you know, so I think, you know, have a five-year plan or say, I'm going to do this and don't say next year, just give yourself a little more time. So have manageable, you know, and that was another problem of mine the past couple of years. I was sitting at a 321 PR and I was in my mind, I wanted to break 310. And, you know, even though I may be able to do that in some training runs consistently, that was way outside my ability. And I was setting myself up for failure. So I think if you break it down into segments and say, I'm just going to do five or 10 minutes um, at a time, then it becomes more manageable. You know, I mean, I know a couple of runners who have gone from mid thirties to sub three takes them a couple of years, but they are slowly knocking away those times. Um, you know, I think the mind, you have to get into the mindset that on your hard days, you're going to push hard. And on your easy days, you're going to go easy. Um, I was in the mindset of like, go, go, go all the time. And so I wasn't giving my body the recovery and the rest that it needed. And so these days I'm running so much faster on my hard days and so much slower on my easy days. And I think that that is helping me. I'm, I'm recovering better. And so I'm ready then to push, you know, to the 90% mark or whatever it may be on the hard days. I think most runners just run too hard on a daily basis. You know, I mean, most of my miles are, are easy pace miles, just building the base. And, you know, and so I think that that's another, and then, Strength training and core work, I, I am a big proponent of. I, once I started doing that over the fall and got into a steady rhythm with it, I felt like I was flying with my pace and how, how I felt. I mean, I would even if I was running the same pace, I felt stronger. I felt like I was controlling the pace rather than just holding on for dear life during some of these workouts. Um, so, you know, focus on the little things. Even if it's, it's 15, 20 minutes a day, it will make you – a much stronger runner and will help with the injury aspect of it as well. If you were strong from head to toe. I love that. I love that. Great advice there. All of it. I mean, I, I agree with every single thing you said there. And one more thing I just wanted to kind of add on to was uh, you said about, you know, taking the five-year plan, which I love that idea, but kind of uh, celebrating the successes along the way. I know sometimes you yes. can get caught up in thinking, 
you know, I want to take off 10 minutes or whatever, you know, whatever it may be, a minute in my, um, a minute in my 5k, but then you get, you know, you get 20 seconds off in your 5k and you think, oh, well, that's great, but I wanted this. So you, you, you don't appreciate the little steps. So that's, you know, something else that is important that people need to pay attention to. Yeah, I agree. Because then that, that keeps you motivated to keep going because then you've hit your goal and now you can move towards towards the next goal. Mm-hmm. So, Definitely. um, yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so finally, let's kind of talk about what the future holds for you. Um, I don't know if you want to share your next goal and if you can't, if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. But uh, you, wine glass marathon is next up for you. So do you want to kind of yeah. tell us about how trainings are? Oh, I guess, I guess you probably have started training by now, but yeah. how that's kind of going. You know, it's going, it's going well so far. You know, I'm still, um, I still have been Boston was three months ago, but I, I'm just starting now to get back into some of the higher mileage. Um, you know, my coach and I really focused on recovery after Boston. So I'm doing 70 miles tomorrow. That's going to be my longest run in three months. Um, but it's going like I'm, I'm, I've been consistent. I've been doing some speed workouts. And so that part's been going really well. I'm 11 weeks out. So this is kind of really like the head down focus time. Um, you know, my goal right now is to PR and I'm going to see how we're going to see how training goes and we'll base the actual nitty gritty times. But I I plan to run the same way, you know, wine glass I did Boston, which is based on effort, you know, have an idea as to what I'm capable of, but not feel so constrained to the time. Um, I I do feel like I, if I train right, it it could be a good day, another good day for me with a, a nice PR. So um, yeah. you know, I'm leaning towards like 310, 312 range, but we'll see how training yeah. goes. Yeah. Let the result take care of itself. Mm. That's what, that's what my coach always says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, just one more question for you, which, uh, every guest is asked, uh, if you could give one word to describe what you would like to become, accomplish or achieve this year, what would it be and why? Oh, goodness. Um, I would just say happy. I mean, I, regardless of the, the finish time in October, I'm, I want to walk away feeling satisfied and happy with my effort, you know, effort over pace is like my, my new motto when it comes to all of my workouts, especially in the heat and humidity, focus on the effort. The pace is irrelevant. Yeah. Um, and so that's really, you know, you, you don't know what the day is going to hold either. I mean, Boston wasn't great weather. And so already in my mindset for that day, it was, you know, it may not be a PR day. It's okay. As long as you, your effort is there and you're smiling mm-hmm. at the finish, that is the only thing that you can control. And so, yeah. um, th- I would say that's my goal for the rest no, of the year. It's just that's to, a great one. to be happy, run happy. So <laughs> Love that. Although we can't say run happy. (laughs) Find us strong. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. And I'm sure our listeners are going to have learned a lot. Um, Great to have you. Thank you. Isn't she lovely? She's one of the most influential women for moving the sport forward in the right direction. But she's also moving the sport of running forward for men as well as women. The topics from today's episode, as well as a link to her blog, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc66. I also encourage you to listen to the Catherine Switzer interview if you have not done already, which can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc59. If today was your first Run to the Top podcast, I hope you enjoyed it. But if you've been listening for a while, I hope you're thinking about subscribing. That way you do not have to remember to check it out every week as it will automatically be downloaded to your phone. You can do that through iTunes or the app you are using to listen today. And of course, as always, I would appreciate any reviews or ratings through iTunes. If you have any suggestions of people you'd like to hear from on the podcast, you can email me, tina at runnersconnect.net. So until then, have a great week.